Okay, uh, so for the first lecture of this course, um, I guess it'll be the first. Sometimes we change the stuff around from year to year. Uh, but I want to talk about, we're going to talk about botany, anatomy, and uh, phonology. Okay, so the real basic kind of science of, uh, of the grapevine. Okay, so you should be able, the outcomes here, you should be able to understand the taxonomic classification of grapevines. Know the different important species of grapevines and their characteristics and usage uses, uh, and then also know grapevine anatomy. Of course, of course, knowing these terms is going to help you as you progress in uh, learning viticulture through this half of the class, because we're going to be using these terms uh, pretty readily in all the lectures from here on in. Uh, and then just kind of understanding basic structure and function of roots. All right, that's this kind of all I want you to know from this. Right, so. As you all should remember from your, um, you know, biology courses and stuff you've taken over the years, right? So this is how taxonomy works. Um, you start with a, the sort of broad domains and then funnel down into the you know, more specific species. Uh, so the family uh, that grapevines fall within is the Taceae. Okay. And then we have the genus Vitis. Um, you can break it into really two subgenera. Um, so you have Vitis and Muscadinia, um, where within Muscadinia, you have Muscadinia rotundifolia. Um, but a lot of times people just think of it as just kind of the genus Vitis. So it used to be, it used to be really that it was Vitis rotundifolia, uh, the genus Vitis and then rotundifolia. The way it's written now is Muscadinia rotundifolia. Okay. Uh, within our genus, we have you know, at least 79 different species. We're generally going to be focusing on uh, vinifera, right? Um, which is accounts for the majority of the grapes and then like uh, Europe. Right, so Riesling, Merlot, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but of course, there's vinifera from all over the place, right? So Thompson Seedless is also called Kishmish uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and Kishmish, and th like Thompson Seedless, probably, uh, I believe, originated somewhere around like Iran. So it's actually a Middle Eastern grape. Um, there actually is a lot of grape growing that happens in. Uh, Iran and in Afghanistan. Um, there's a ton of really interesting grapes in Afghanistan. They get used mostly for fresh fruit uh, and for like juices. Um, yeah. And then of course you have things like Labrusca, right? These are actually what are, what are considered like Labrascana grapes. Uh, you should remember from 1104, uh, true Labrusca is not self-fertile. Right, so true Labrusca needs a male and a female plant to pollinate, right? So the male po the male plant pollinates the female plant, and you get fruit on the female plant. Uh, Labrascana grapes are mostly Labrusca in their parentage, uh, but they uh, have some like Vitis vinifera or something else in it, and they are self-fertile, uh, which is why we grow them on farms. It's much harder when things have to pollinate from plant to plant, right? Much easier when they pollinate themselves. Then over here, again, you see rotundifolia uh, as a species. Remember, it'd be Muscadinia rotundifolia, not Vitis rotundifolia. So this diagram is slightly slightly incorrect because um, it's a there's two sort of subgenera, right? There's Vitis and Muscadinia. Uh, rotundifolia is also native to the United States. Uh, when you think of muscadine, oftentimes if you, if you all listen to country music, you'll hear people talk about muscadine wine. I think it's not really because they drink muscadine wine. I think it's really more because they like the way it rhymes uh, with itself. Uh, but muscadine wine is actually pretty popular in the South. Um, again, if you took 1104 uh, last year or the year before, you had muscadine wine. Uh, in one of my lectures, you had uh, a bit of muscadine. It was uh, scupperdong from North Carolina, uh, from Duplin cellars. 
So yeah, this vinifera is easily the most commonly used grape for wine production around the world. If you'll recall, about 50% of all grapes are used for wine production, the remainder being used for uh, like juices and value-added products, uh, with very little fruit actually being used for fresh fruit consumption because uh, of storage issues. Um, and just remember things like cultivar and variety, that's used interchangeably um, within our industry. But recall from 1104, cultivar is actually what we're growing. That's a cultivated variety, right? So Pinot Noir is a cultivar of grape. And variety is actually the, the wild species itself, OK? Um, so yeah. So you have these, like, the species is Vitis vinifera, and then we'll have these varieties, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Thompson Seedless. Again, technically these are cultivars, not varieties, but we call them varieties in the wine industry. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. Um, and so when, when you hear about things being varietally labeled, like varietal wines, that's single variety. That's Pinot Noir, okay? So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on taxonomy. I think it's kind of maybe useful to go through it slightly. Um, Right, so of course, uh, is you know, grapevines are eukaryotes. They're not prokaryotes. They're not single, single cell organisms. Um, and uh, yeah, so anything that's a eukaryote, it's a sexually reproducing higher organism with large cells, a nucleus containing DNA, and uh, the cell organelles have have like mitochondria and plastids, right? Um, but there are other things that are important. So while we have, while our plant is eukaryote, uh, there are things like bacteria that are important to grapevines because they can cause diseases, right? Like crown gall and Pierce's disease, which both clog up uh, the vascular tissue and cause the grapevine to go into water stress and then eventually die. Uh, the kingdom, of course, uh, we are plant. Right, so we're not an animal, fungi, or a protist. Um, so it's a plant. Right, there's over half a million plant species. Um, yeah, divided into twelve phyla. Sorry for that. There's some issues here in, in the in the slides. Um, they they are magnoliophytes, uh, which are which is kind of a new term. Uh, magnoliophytes are just flowering plants, um, and the seeds grown within ovaries. Um, yeah, the flowers are, are is fertilized and becomes, you know, becomes fruit, right? Um, so yeah, again, sorry for the for the uh, the slide formatting issues. Um, all right, so now let's move to class. So they are dicots, um, and actually, this has changed now. From there's another one, monocots, dicots. They've this is all taxonomy is very frustrating uh, because truthfully, from a from a practical perspective, I'm, I'm more of a, a practical grape grower. Uh, I'm not like a breeder or a taxonomist. Uh, but these things change a lot. Um, but in in on my end of things, it doesn't change what I do in the on the farm. Uh, but again, uh, this has changed. Uh, and so I should probably update this to, to um, be with the times, but truly most of us just still think of these as, as dicots, um, which are plants that start their lives with two cotyledons, which are like when a plant emerges, when the, when the leaves emerge initially, they'll come out with one or two leaves, and that's, that's what, how you discern them, right? So, um, Things like grasses just emerge, one leaf emerges, and that those are monocots. Okay. And then Romnalis is our order. Um, and within Romnalis, there's four families. Um, there's the Linaceae, um, which maybe at some point, again, this is where tax taxonomy is like, what is it? Oh, it's always changing. Uh, and this may be just 
this may be shrunk down into three families, um, and this may start to be included within the Vitaceae. Um, I, I, I don't really know why. I'm not, again, I'm not a taxonomist, so I'm not sure why taxonomists are debating putting these in with Vitaceae. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's because, I don't know, they're like, they're woody perennials with aggregated flowers that create these inflorescences. I don't, I don't know. And they're kind of climbing. I, I, I really don't, don't fully understand why they would do that. So then within the family Vitaceae, there's about a thousand different species and 17 different genera, right? So what are Vitaceae? They're woody climbers, right? So it comes from this Latin worm, Latin word to attach, right? So they, they climb using these little tendrils, uh, which I'll show you when we talk about anatomy. Um, yeah, most of these species exist, exist in the subtropics and in the uh, tropics. Uh, of course, right, uh, our grapevine, Vitis vinifera, originated in Eurasia and the Transcaucasus, somewhere around modern day Georgia. Um, so definitely not in the tropics and the subtropics. Uh, but most of the family Vitaceae are found in the tropics and subtropics, right? Generally, they have fibrous, well branched roots. Okay. So let's look at the genuses, right? So again, there's those. You can kind of look at it as like one main main genus like this, but really it's two subgenera, um, and it's Vitis and Muscadinia, right? And it's based on the number of chromosomes. Uh, one has more than the other. Um, Muscadinia is very interesting. This is the one you had in 1104. Uh, Muscadinia is very interesting. It has hairless, completely hairless leaves. Uh, Vinifera always has some kind of hair on it. Um, also, vinifera has shredding bark, where muscadina has very smooth bark, uh, and also very different from from vinifera. Muscadinia has ha really hard wood, um, so yeah, it's, they're quite different. The first known uh, wine making from grapes um, is said to have happened by. French Huguenots that landed in modern day Jacksonville and they made wine out of what people think was probably Muscadinia. Um, I mean, certainly it was Muscadinia. It was near modern day Jacksonville. They think it was probably something like Scuppernong uh, and the French Huguenots did not enjoy it because uh, it kind of smells like a little bit kind of like rubber cement, like a fruity rubber cement. Okay. Um, so yeah, Muscadinia, it co-evolved a lot of pests and diseases that are native to North America. So anything that really originated here in North America um, is tolerant to all those kind of endemic or uh, uh, you know, you know, native uh, pests and diseases that are, that are an issue for Vitis vinifera. So Muscadinia is tolerant of things like phylloxera, the root louse that gets on the root makes a hole and then that little wound is then able to be um, taken over by fungal pathogens in the soil and then the vascular tissue is clogged and the vine dies, right? So this vinifera can die from this, but Muscadinia will not, um, as well as all the other native North American grapes. Also diseases like powdery mildew and downy mildew, um, can be withstood by Muscadinia pretty well, as well as black rot. Pierce's disease, as well, Pierce's disease is a bacterial disease. It's transmitted by xylem feeders. Um, so the bacteria gets into the xylem and then it just propagates and clogs it up. And of course, the xylem is carrying water up from the roots. Uh, and so then the vine goes into water stress that can't be ameliorated uh, and the vines will die. Uh, and then also, interestingly, Muscadinia, uh, especially like Muscadinia rotundifolia, is um, tolerant of Zyphonema index as well as uh, the virus, which is Zyphonema index vector, which is called family virus. Uh, so at least some Muscadinia is. Um, so that's very useful. So what happens with this is this virus gets in the plant, vectored by this nematode, which are a little like microscopic worms. The virus gets in there, 
uh, and then the plant quickly degenerates and eventually dies. This is a big issue in France. Uh, the family, what they call a courtnoy, or show, short knot is the translation, um, is moving rapidly through many areas of France, uh, like Burgundy, uh, I believe also in Champagne there's quite a bit, and I think in Bordeaux as well. Um, so we can use things like we can use Muscadinia rotundifolia in rootstocks to help combat these issues. So there are rootstocks like these, GRN1 and O3916, which where you can see they have rotundifolia in the parentage. Remember, so this says vitis rotundifolia. Remember, however, now it's not really called vitis rotundifolia, it's called Muscadinia. It's, a, it's its own genus. Um, so these rootstocks here are usually used in areas where you have this vector for family, Zephinina index. Um, and they confer, they have, they're tolerant of the, the vector, but they're also somewhat tolerant of the virus itself. Okay. Now this, this one here, O3916 is interesting because it has Vitis vinifera in the parentage, right? And what is one issue with Vitis vinifera in a rootstock, right? It collapses to phylloxera. So there's a real potential here for O3916 o to succumb to phylloxera. It may happen. There was a rootstock called AXR1, which very famously collapsed to phylloxera in the late 80s and in the early 90s. And about like 60 to 70% of Napa actually had to get replanted. So having a vineyard in Napa that's older than uh, uh, the late 80s is actually relatively rare. And so here you can see a vineyard that's being replanted. Um, and you can see their, their rootstocks there. So this is the, called the Tokolon Vineyard. It's um, in Napa. It's right off of the Robert Mondavi Winery. Uh, Mondavi, I think, owns part of it. Um, but the Beckstoffer family owns a large portion of it. This fruit sells for approximately $20,000 a ton. Uh, it's incredibly expensive, probably some of I mean, it is the, some of the most expensive fruit in the States. It may be the most expensive fruit. Um, so they have nematode issues on that property. Uh, they have fan leaf there. Um, so when they planted in 94 and these Beckstoffer blocks, they planted with O3916 because that was the rootstock that people had at the time to deal with Zephinima index. Um, and then now they're replanting and they're using a newer rootstock, GRN3, right? So this might collapse. This probably won't collapse because it's, I believe GRN3, like GRN1, is also repestrous by, this repestrous by Muscadinia rotundifolia. A couple other things to note in here just for, for interest's sake. Uh, so let's look up at the variety. So it's both Cabernet Sauvignon, both the same clone, but they've changed... So you can see this is clone 4, and this is clone 4.1. Point 0.1 just means it's clone 4, but it's it's gone through what's called uh, protocol 2010, which means it's been micro shoot tip cultured, which like is just basically a way for UC Davis uh, to clean up plant material before they send it out to the nurseries for propagation. Uh, we'll talk more about that in, in future lectures. Um, but that's... You know, and, and now our industry is starting to mature. We have a lot more viruses uh, out there. So that's becoming a concern. You'll also notice they've changed the row orientation. Uh, so here they were planted slightly to the northwest. So it's sort of like, you can see my cursor kind of that direction, right? Northwest, southeast. Now they're, they're moving it over to northeast, southwest. And the reason for that is so that at solar noon, or like when the, when the day is hottest, the sun is directly over the canopy so that your fruit is shaded out so you're not heating your fruit up too much. If we heat fruit up too much, we can sunburn it and we can do things like stop uh, fruit development uh, or like start, you know, kind of hinder ripening, slow things down. Um, we can also, if fruit gets hotter than 95 degrees, um, color formation can be hindered, can basically stop. 
And if we go like above 100 degrees or so, then we start really getting into color degradation. So whatever color you did build up, you actually will start to lose it as your fruit gets really, really hot. Um, so that's kind of what that's, that's the purpose there. You can also see a move towards a tighter row spacing. Um, and that, this here getting seven feet as opposed to eight feet will give you more tons per acre. And then you can also see tighter spacing between plants. Uh, and that's really kind of more of a function of here. They did seven feet and they were like, Ooh, man, like that's actually quite far apart for how vigorous these vines are. They're not actually that vigorous that we need seven feet between vines. We can leave less buds, uh, and have a, a balanced vine. So they just moved down to seven to, to five feet. Okay. And then the vine training system is the same. And then the cross arms, what a cross arm is, is just a way to spread out the catch wires on a trellis. Um, and I'll show you these more as we get into operations. But it just kind of, it's again, this is about shading fruit further, right? So as the climate is warming up, uh, things are getting hotter and hotter, then uh, we kind of want to shade things out a little more because we don't want the fruit to be negatively impacted by that heat. Um, yeah. The other thing to say about O3916 and, and, and the reason for them moving from O3916 to GRN3 is it's very vigorous. Uh, GRN3 might be slightly less vigorous, but also O3916 picks up a lot of potassium. Um, and GRN3 may not. And that's kind of, the potassium pickup is kind of an issue with O3916 um, because uh, it displaces hydrogen protons in the solution, right? So, so you can end up with like a high TA, but also a high pH, right? So that's, that's kind of problematic. We don't want high pHs. Wine can be microbially, uh, unstable at high pHs, but as well as things like color can be unstable. Okay. Um, yeah. So then moving on from Muscadinia, looking at Vitis. It occurs in temperate, temperate and subtropical areas of the Northern Hemisphere. We have roughly 60 to 70 species that fit within Vitis. Um, all these species within the genus can be interbred and grafted with one another. So we do have American species of Vitis, right? About 34 different species. Um, none of them have perfect flowers. Um, so that means they need male and female plants to fertilize. So like I said, Vitis labrusca is native to the eastern United States. Um, so the things like, you often think of Concord as a labrusca grape. It's actually labrascana because it's, uh, it doesn't have a perfect flower. It, it, um, or I mean, it does have a perfect flower rather. It fertilizes itself. There are very cold tolerant varieties, very disease resistant varieties or disease tolerant varieties. Um, they're susceptible to these, you know, rots, but still not even that much. Um, so remember, like, yeah, these are the grapes that kind of have, like, Labrascanas have those kinds of foxy aromas, grapey aromas. Think Welch's grape juice with these, right? Or, like, when you think about uh, some kosher wines, uh, like Manischewitz or Mogan David are made from uh, Concord. Okay. Then, of course, you have Vitis riparia. Uh, which is, as the name suggests, found along riverbanks, right? So you have riparian areas or riparian strips, and those are, are riparian zones. When you hear those things, that means areas right by a riverbank. Um, and because this riparia is generally found by riverbanks, the rooting angle is shallow, right? Because the water table is usually high. It makes total sense. So the roots are going to go outward rather than down, uh, which makes it not super drought tolerant. Um, it also has quite poor lime tolerance. Um, so if we're in France and we're in Burgundy and we have high lime in our soils, we can end up having these kind of like lime induced chloroses. Um, and we need to deal, we need to have uh, rootstocks that can, can deal with those, those high levels of lime. So riparia may not be the best for it. Um, uh, or like just you know straight riparia may not be the best in those sites. Um, it's also it tends to be so if we if we plant Vitis riparia if we use it as a rootstock and the rootstock for Vitis riparia is called Riparia gloire, 
rg. Uh, usually the fruit on that vine will ripen quicker than other rootstocks, um, which I think is kind of a function of kind of rooting angle and sort of the vines start to go into a little bit of a water stress sooner. Um, so they start to ripen a little bit, a little faster. Um, but I don't, don't really know. It, it is very cold hardy. Right? So these vines can get down to negative 25 Fahrenheit and be fine. Uh, so it's often, Vitus riparia is often used in um, grape breeding programs due to cold hardiness. But they're also using grape breeding programs for fruit color because Vitus riparia produces really some really dark fruit. Um, yeah, it's also tolerant of phylloxera because it's native to, the North, to North America where phylloxera came from. Uh, it's also often used as a rootstock parent. Vitus repestris is native to the Southwest. It's almost extinct in the wild uh, because of just things like building houses and stuff. Uh, it's found on old rocky creek beds. Um, it can be quite vigorous on its own. Uh, on its own, it's called, we have Rupestris St. George. Um, pretty vertical rooting structure. And you could think if it's being grown on these rocky, old rocky creek beds, right, those shallow, those soils um, are, you know, the roots are going to really kind of want to explore, right? Um, otherwise, they'd get into droughts. So, they're generally pretty drought tolerant, not on shallow soils, of course, but that's just because the soils are shallow. Uh, but generally, these these roots will go down and, and uh, can root stocks with this in its parentage are not going to be super drought sensitive. Also, flocks are tolerant because it's North American, right? Okay, I'm going to uh, leave it here, and then we're going to pick up on the next video um, just for for sake of time.